Good morning. Good morning and welcome. It is great to gather together as God's people, as those that he has brought here in this time and this place to worship him and to grow in our faith and to enjoy being his people, his family. So welcome to one and all. It is wonderful to gather together this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus. Well, let's settle our hearts and our minds for a moment as Charlie, thank you, Charlie. I'm going to invite Carol up to, to lead us in our call to worship this morning, which is found uh, from selections from Psalm 139. So please take out your bulletin and uh, responsively read the call to worship together. Good morning. Good morning. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me, and, and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you love us. You love us so much that you sent your son to take on the fall for us because you loved us above all. Lord, you love us enough to search us and to know us and to seek us out, to call us back to yourself. So we come to you this morning. Once more, we, we bring ourselves to you. We bring our hearts and our lives. We bring our thoughts and our actions. We bring ourselves to you. We ask that you would Show us where we would need correcting, where we would need changing, and also encourage us on our way to you. Lead us in the way of everlasting. We are here for you, and we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, please stand with me, and let's sing together, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, which is found on hymn page 314 in your hymnal in front of you. Hymn page 314, Blessed Assurance.
God when we have faith in Jesus Christ. And the first, well, one of the first steps of having faith in Jesus Christ is to admit that we need Him, admit our sin and our shortcomings, and confess to Him, and then, as the scriptures say, acknowledge our sins to Him and not cover our iniquities. To say, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and He will forgive the iniquity of our sins. So, as most of us know, we take a few moments each Sunday just to settle our hearts, to confess to the Lord those things that perhaps we have not yet, so we can be forgiven. So let's take a few moments individually in silence at this time. confess we've fallen far, far, far short of your goodness and your glory. We've doubted your love. We've denied your word. We've run the other way. But you've called us out of hiding. And so we respond to you. Lord, you say the wages of sin is death. But the free gift that you have for us is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we, we turn away from the death dealing sin that we all participate in, and we turn back to you so we can receive your forgiveness and receive eternal life. So thank you so much for Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Up to the microphone to read for us Genesis 3, 1 through 13. Now we are all about the good news, but to, uh, to understand the good news, you need to know the bad news. So today is the scripture is indeed the bad news of fall of humanity found in Genesis 3, 1 through 13. So please take out your scriptures or your insert and let's follow. So Genesis 3, 1 through 13. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat? of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die. For God knows that when you eat it of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin cloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to, me, gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived. This is the word of the Lord, it's true, it's trustworthy, and we look to the Spirit to use it to change our lives and hearts even this morning as we look at it closer together in a few moments. Well, now's our opportunity for offering, and we're going to have our choir come up, but not yet, because Marion has asked to do a, a, a dramatic reading for us. And we've had some poetry readings lately and some visual art lately, so uh, Marion is going to contribute a dramatic reading for us. Is it, am I saying it right? Is it dramatic? I think it's... Yeah. We'll see how dramatic she gets, but a reading at the very least. This comes from John chapter 14, no, 4, 
it happens to be noontime when the story takes place. Jesus and his disciples are on their way from Jerusalem to Galilee, having been down uh, to Jerusalem during Passover, and, Ga and they have stopped over in a little town in Samaria that is about halfway, and they still have a long day journey to go. It's noontime, and of course that's lunch, and, he, and they're very tired, and Jesus is tired and thirsty, and he needs to rest. He has sent the disciples to get food. And while he, uh, they're gone, he's going to sit by the Jacob's well that is uh, in a little town in Samaria. And this well was uh, built, centered before Jesus ever was born. And it has the name of Jacob's well, who is an ancestor of Jesus. And it is known for its cool, clear, refreshing water. And as he sits there, along comes a lady, a lady from Samaria. Now the Samaritans and the Jews do not like each other very well, and so they don't really like to associate with each other. But in the story, you will hear that he encounters her, and she is an outcast. And you probably could say a woman ill refute. And uh, you will understand that as the story goes. And let's hear her story. It's been another long day, hurrying along. I'm looking down, not thinking. I've lost all sense of hoping for anything to be different, of expecting anything good could happen. Just another day to get by. But then I met this man. Not just any man, not even a prophet, but more. A man who went out his way to deliver to come to meet me. Me, a woman, a Samaritan, rejected, unimportant, not respected or appreciated in any way considered property but had no value, just alone and lost, discarded by five men who married me and then found someone they liked better, divorced me, just like that. You're out, leave, be gone. I came to the well with my jug today, weary, discouraged, hopeless, and helpless, and met a man who spoke to me, not wanting anything from me but a drink of Jacob's well, and who offered me a drink of something so much more. And he offered me a drink of precious living water that was greater than the still water of my ancestors, of water which so filled my soul that it would never run out, a spring of water gushing up eternal life, available only through him, the promised Messiah. You know this unquenchable living water, the Holy Spirit well, welling up in every one of the believers. The questions he asked. He knew about my five husbands and my present unmarried relationship with no commitment on either of our parts. He knew the reality of my now hopeless life. And he did not turn away. When I was felt I was so what I felt was so compassionate, a loving presence in this gentle man who knew everything about my life and did not reject me. Here finally was someone who cared. My soul stirred with hope, a new eagerness. Could this really be the Messiah talking with me? A man who was there to use me, but to, no, but to offer me a gift beyond my deserving of wildest hope. He listened to my heart. He accepted me as I was, and he invited me to step out on a new path with hope, a sense of worth, joy. Jesus told me that he indeed was the promised Messiah. I am he the one who is speaking to you. 
His friends then returned, astonished that he would be speaking with a woman. The rush of energy, hope, joy just filled me so passionately I left my jug right there at the well. All my burdens, failures, guilt, and everything that had dragged me down. I ran, yes, I ran with abandonment into the village, up and down the streets. There was such a change in me that the villagers gathered to hear what I was calling out, inviting them to come and see this man who knows all about me. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? Come and meet him for yourselves, I called out, and so they did. Then they invited Jesus back to the village. They listened to him for two days, growing in their joyful understanding of his wisdom, his teachings, his passionate love, and the wonder his compassionate care for everyone proclaiming. Now, they said, we feel, we believe because we have heard him for ourselves and not because of what he did with us. He is indeed our savior of this world. And so that scripture, I feel, uh, so inspired the writer of the music that the choir is going to sing, Fill My Cup, Lord, Richard Blinter, that uh, we can realize that she had a story to tell and now you know her story. And we still have a story to tell, too. I'm going to keep reminding you of that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Marion. Yes, I invite the choir to come on up and sing for us. Fill my cup, Lord. And as they begin, please, uh, ushers would come forward for our morning offering. Thank you so much, Laura. And if you are our guests here, we're glad that you're here, but please don't feel obligated to contribute. But uh, as the Lord may move your heart, he does indeed love a cheerful giver. This is our opportunity for those of us who are part of this church to contribute to the needs of the gospel here. And we're very thankful for the, for the choir this morning. So let us uh, hear as they sing, fill my cup, Lord.
Thank you very much, choir. Let's stand together and let's sing, give thanks with a grateful heart. The words are found in your bulletin. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. We do give you thanks. We thank you for the gift of music. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of the gospel. And Lord, we thank you for each gift that the, we've been able to contribute this morning. I pray that you would bless and multiply each gift and each giver for the work of your gospel. So more and more men and women and children would come to life here and be around the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's look more carefully at our scriptures this morning. Please take out your, your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 3. As we look together at Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, uh, a, a very, very key portion of scripture that we often call the fall, where Adam and Eve fell to temptation, and we've been dealing with the repercussions ever since. So Genesis chapter 3. So I can't, I can't talk about this story without giving you a, a snake story of my own. So um, I, I, you hear me talk about every now and then, um, you know, our family has a place up on Lake Bomazine and it's, you know, the, the cottage itself is only like, I don't know, 100 yards from the water. And so we're in the water pretty often there. And a few years ago, I don't remember exactly how many years ago, the kids, one of the kids was splashing in the water. And I was on the shore, I think, or near, more near the shore. And I see something just like this, this isn't an exact picture, but I see something just like this headed toward one of the kids. And it had like, you know, when snakes swim, it looks especially like evil, right? <laughs> because it's all serpentine. And, uh, and it was headed right toward one of the kids, and I was freaking out. So, of course, I like um, jump into the water and try to distract, you know, scoop up the kid, try to distract the snake, and the snake was, was scared away enough. It, 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 turned and went toward the shore, and uh, I was like, well, what do we do with this snake? I didn't know what kind, you know, Vermont is sort of like Ireland, where there's no, really no poisonous snakes. Did you know that? There's only like one small pocket of poisonous snakes in the state of Vermont. Um, and uh, so I sort of knew in my head, all right, this isn't a, a dangerous snake, but at the same time, any snake that's going after my kid is going to die. So, um, so I called up to my dad, who was up at the cottage, I'm like, Dad, you got a shovel, you got a gun, what do you got? And he's like, oh, it's just a rat snake or something. Leave it alone, it'll eat the rats for us. I'm like, no, it was going after one of the kids. But, you know, the, the instinct is, all right, here's something dangerous, here's something evil, it needs to go. And so, I, you know, I found out where, it was, where its kind of nest was and figured out, got a closer look, okay, it is a rat snake, it is basically harmless, it is good for, for the environment, good for our atmosphere here, whatever you want to call it. So we let it live, but <laughs> um, just that, that instinct of this is threatening, this is threatening to us, this is something that I need to take care of, this is something I need, we need to run away from, this is something we need to, to take seriously. Uh, well, it reminds me a little bit of, of this story, because when the serpent showed up with Adam and Eve, um, I'm not sure why they talked to it, honestly. Um, I, obviously, this is like a long, long time ago, 
And so we don't know exactly what the deal was, why, why they didn't seem to think this was a big deal, but um, they, they didn't. <laughs> so uh, I want to look a little closer at what was going on with Adam and Eve when they were uh, in discussion, so to speak, with the serpent and what happened. So I think the, the overarching um, tragedy here is that they doubted God's love. They doubted God's love. And the, the tempter, you know, I don't know exactly how, you can read all different theological perspectives of, all right, was, was, was Satan embodied in this, the serpent? Um, or would, did Satan somehow use the serpent? Or was, I, I don't know exactly. I don't think that's really the point to figure out exactly what was going on here. We do know from later scriptures that Satan was, was somehow using this serpent to tempt Adam and Eve away from God. And he, clearly, he succeeded. So I think it's helpful to see what, what's going on here. And they doubted God's love, and they distorted God's word. They denied God's command, and they desired God's place. I'm sorry for all the Ds. You know, sometimes it just flows. Um, I, if that's annoying to you, if that's annoying to you, I'm sorry. If you, if that's, if you like that, then good. But first of all, they, they doubted God's love. Did you you notice here where he said, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Well, actually, he didn't actually say that. So the, they get off on a really bad note because, well, the serpent doesn't have a full frontal attack. He kind of just sows a seed of doubt, right? Did God really say that? And they kind of entertain this idea, well, let's see, what did God really say? And they, they intentionally or not, they distorted God's word. So their first mistake, I think, was engaging the serpent in conversation at all. But And the second mistake was they distorted God's word. They minimized what God said because here it says, in the midst of the garden, he said, the woman said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but, but God said, you may not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. You might just read past that and say, not, not a big deal. She neglected to name what was there? She just said that tree in the middle of the garden. She didn't say, she did not name the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which God named for them. So I think part, she, the, she's going off the rails here because, have you noticed when you name something, when you're tempted to do something, and it's more of a vague idea, you, you're more willing to go along with it. But if you say, wait a second, what is this thing that's in front of me? If you name it, then it gives more, you know, when you can really identify something, you can resist it. Well, and then their third command is, or excuse me, the third mistake is that they, they exaggerate God's command. Did you notice uh, and here in, God said, you should not eat the tree, and Eve said, neither shall you touch it. She exaggerated God's command. What's going on there? Well, if you exaggerate something, it's easier to rebel against it. So if, if, uh, if I say, clean your room, or I'll put away your toys for a week, and, uh, and then you hear five minutes later, Daddy said, clean my room, or he's going to throw away all my toys in the dumpster. <laughs> it's easier to rebel against an exaggerated command, right? It's, it's a human nature. Well. The key here, I think, is to know what God said. Know what God said. God told Adam this. He clear, uh, somehow the sermon got wind of it. Eve, he told Eve that. She didn't quite get it right, or she didn't bring it back right, at least. So the key is to know God's word. Don't minimize it, and don't exaggerate it either. You know, distorting God's word makes it much easier to deny God's commands, and much easier to doubt God's love. So the serpent here sees an opening here in verse, verse 4 and 5, and now he's, he, goes a, he goes full frontal assault. He says, you will not surely die, and he claims to know God's intentions. Beware of anyone, including myself, who claims to speak for God but doesn't actually quote God or misquotes God. He's misquoting God. He's, he's saying he knows what God is saying, when he's got the opposite going. He's feeding her half-truths. He's feeding her half-truths. He's telling her, 
what she'll gain, but not what she will lose. And the same, I think, can go for us. Uh, I put it like this. The tempter will tell you what you'll gain, but he will not tell you what you'll lose, and you will always lose more than you gain. I don't care if it's the smallest quote-unquote sin, if it's the biggest, baddest thing you can think of. When you're tempted to do it, he will tell you what you'll gain, but you will not know what you'll lose. And what you lose is always more than what you'll gain. Now, she should have said, hold on, Satan. Not today, Satan, as I've seen on t-shirts and stuff. Uh, not today. Stop right there. Who are you to contradict the word of God? That's not what God said. And Adam, you know, we can't be blaming Eve so much. Actually, the scriptures blame Adam because he was right there passively the whole time. The way you can read the scripture, Adam was there the whole time watching it play out, and he did nothing. So, yeah, Adam should have ran and got the shovel and chopped the thing's head off. But it didn't work out that way. They were falling prey to distorting God's word, to denying God's command, and doubting God's love. They doubted God's love. And when you doubt God's love, if you say, I don't know if God really loves me, that to me is where you start to go off the rails. That's where sin has its origins. I don't know if God really loves me, so I need to take this for myself. If I can't trust God, I'm going to trust myself instead. So they were desiring God's place. The tempter was playing on their pride, and he was playing on their desires. He's basically saying God is holding out on you. He doesn't want you to be everything you, you really could be. Don't you want to reach your full potential? Instead of wanting to be with God, they wanted to be God. When we choose to sin, when you and I choose to sin, we, don't, we, we trade being with God, being intimate with God, being close with God. We trade that for wanting to be God, be in charge. And so they did it. She looked at it, she delighted in it, she desired it, she took it, and so did he. And this, as I said, this isn't only Eve's fault. Adam was right there the whole time, and the scriptures constantly hold Adam as the one accountable. The deed was done, and as the song goes, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. The scriptures, uh, or the, excuse me, the, the, the history of, of the theology of this, we often call this the fall. It might even be the heading of your Bible, depending on what version you have. Uh, we call this the fall. And if you ever wonder, why is this world messed up? Here we go. It's right here. If somebody on the evening news says, I just don't understand why X, Y, and Z has happened, it's right here. Sin has entered in the world, and we have what is sometimes called a sin problem, both inside and outside. We, as our our human frailty is now infected with sin, and it also went out into the world at large. We, and I say we because Adam and Eve were our, our representatives, but we also participate in it. I have yet to meet someone who would rightfully claim that they've never done anything wrong. So we participate in it, because we also distort God's word, we deny God's command, we desire God's place because we've doubted God's love. And the tragic result of this is destroying God's intimacy. We've destroyed God's intimacy with us. Did you notice that God was walking in the cool, in the garden, uh, in the cool of the day, as it says here in verse 8 of chapter 3? That to me, it, is a wonderful picture. That it seems like they used to take walks in the woods together. And so God is, is out on his walk in the woods or in the garden. That seems to be a very close relationship that they had. And clearly they must have had a close relationship that was now destroyed. We, we've destroyed God's intimacy with us. As we've seen in the other chapters, early chapters of Genesis, you and I were designed for intimacy with God. But the sin that you and I participate in, whether it's big or small, is destroying that intimacy, has destroyed and continues to destroy that intimacy, so we are separated from God. The good news is God was not content with that separation. And we'll get to that in a minute. Because, well, we'll get to that right now, actually, because 
what is the first thing that God does? He says, where are you? Now you could read that, where are you? You can read that, where, where are you? I don't know if the grammar itself uh, can, would contribute to knowing exactly which way to, to read that, but I see God here pursuing in a, a gentle way. He doesn't go and crush them. He, he even warned them back in Genesis 2, if you eat this, you will surely die. So they may have expected, all right, we're done, lights out. But in a sense, it was worse. They spiritually died. They were separated from God, and he goes after them. He doesn't leave them on their own. There's no fire and brimstone, no yelling and screaming, no striking them dead. What does he do? He says, where are you? Where are you? He comes with a walk in the garden with questions and a gentle pursuit. Where are you? Where are you? And can you take a moment, even right now, to hear that question for yourself? Where are you? Where are you? No matter what you've done, good or bad, no matter where you've been, I think you can still hear this question from God, where are you? Are you hiding from God or are you hiding in God? Are you running from God or are you running to God? Are you saying, uh-oh, I messed up, don't tell dad, he will be really mad. Or are you saying, uh-oh, I messed up, I better tell dad, he'll know what to do. That to me is the choice that we have. Are we going to keep running away from God or are we going to run to God? Well, Adam and Eve, at this point, they chose to run away from God. Because God keeps up his loving pursuit here in verse 11 and he says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And then the blame game gets started right? First Adam hides, and then he starts blaming. Can anyone else relate to this? I hope so. Because when I'm busted, I try to hide, and then I try to look for any excuse to, you know, at least kind of give myself a little sense of, well, I deserve that, or, or I, you know, it's not that big of a deal, or, oh, what about what this, what she said over there, or what that, remember that over there? Either you're hiding or you're blaming. Dismiss it, dodge it, blame shift, whatever you want to call it. This is the human condition. Have you ever been confronted directly? And maybe even gently. Have you ever been co confronted gently and directly by someone who said, you know, remember when you said this or remember when you did that? What's up with that? And it's so easy to start to dodge and to blame. And that's exactly what they do. They dismiss God's inquiry here and they start denouncing God's gifts. You know, why did I say denouncing God's gifts just a chapter ago? It could have been minutes ago for all we know. It could have been years ago. It doesn't say. When Eve showed up, Adam was like, awesome! This is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she's taken out of man. The, the first song and poem in the human history and now, just a few verses later, we don't know what, how much time elapsed. Could have been a couple hours, could have been years or decades, I don't know. But now, instead of bursting into song from his beloved, he's denouncing her. He has the, the, the nerve to blame both Eve and God. Did you, did you notice that? He said, this woman that you gave me is the problem. He is in neck deep on the blame game. Oh, the stupid things we say when we're busted, right? And you just want to say, come on, Adam, just stop. Just stop. You're making it worse. Just stop already. And he was making it worse. He, was, he not only destroyed his intimacy with God, his creator, he destroyed his intimacy with his beloved, his wife. How many moments ago was he rejoicing in her and now all trust is broken? Now their intimacy is destroyed, intimacy with each other and intimacy with God 
And of course, Eve does the same thing. She blames the serpent. Actually, to her credit, Eve doesn't blame Adam or God. She blames the serpent. And you could say maybe rightly so, because she, he did dis deceive her. But she doesn't really fess up to the very end of her statement. She says, uh, you know, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Yeah, yeah I guess I, I kind of did that, right? But it was his fault. All of this has the cumulative effect of destroying intimacy with God. And I, I would love for us to be able to identify with that. Because that's what the scriptures are asking us to do. The scriptures are asking us to identify with this. Which, you know, destroying intimacy with God is, is another way to say spiritual death. They died spiritually. God said you will die, and they did. They died spiritually. Adam and Eve, and you and I, are spiritually dead until God revives us. We're separated from God who loves us with no hope of reuniting on our own. Now, Apostle Paul in Romans 7 says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who will deliver me from this body of death? And that's just a, a call for, we are dying for God's rescue. We are dying for God's rescue. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I put this a little bit visually here. The wages of sin is death. There's no way around it. The wages of sin is death. When we participate in sin, big or small, we die spiritually. And the outworkings of that is all sorts of death. We die when we sin. We have earned it. The wages. We, wages are something you earn, right? We've earned it. But the free gift of God is Jesus, eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, you know, in investigating Genesis 3 here, it helps to know how temptation works. It really does. The scriptures encourage us to understand how the enemy works so we can resist him. But the main reason that this scripture is here is to show us our condition. We are dead in our sin with no hope on our own. We are dying for God's rescue. We desperately need a savior. If you're in a place on your journey of faith and you're saying, I'm not so sure I can agree with that, then I'm not so sure you've really met Jesus. Because Jesus says, repent and believe. And the whole idea of repenting is turning from your sin. We need to be able to own the bad news so we can understand the good news. So we can receive the good news. The bad news, I'm a sinner. The good news, I need a savior. Jesus is my savior. So when we compare, you know, the scriptures call Jesus the second Adam. The first Adam messed it up. So we needed a second Adam. Jesus didn't doubt God's love like Adam did. Jesus didn't doubt God's love. He came to demonstrate it. God demonstrates his love for us in this that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus didn't doubt it. He demonstrated his love. And Jesus didn't destroy God's intimacy with us like Adam did. He came to restore it. The second Adam has fixed what the first Adam has messed up. And you and I are dying for God's rescue. So Jesus came to die in our place. He gives us the victory over sin and death that we never could have had on our own. It's a free gift. And what's the condition of it? Are there any conditions on a gift? When if it's, it's your birthday, you know, happy birthday, Calvin, in a couple days. If I give Calvin a gift, I have no idea what he really wants, probably a Starbucks gift card or something. If, if I give Calvin a gift, are there any conditions on it? So, not really. All he has to do is res take it, right? Here, Calvin. You're a great guy. I'm glad you're in our church family. Here's a gift. But when is it his? It's his when he takes it. So God is, in a sense, offering us a gift. This is a gift of eternal life, of salvation, of, of restoring the intimacy with God. Bring it back to the way it was always supposed to be. God offers us this gift by sending Jesus to die on the cross for us. And when is it ours? When we take it, when we take it from him. 
when we receive it. So you have to want it. If for whatever reason, you know, I wanted to give somebody a gift who really didn't like me. I don't, I don't think Calvin doesn't like me. Calvin's a great guy. So maybe there's somebody out there that really doesn't like me, and I say, well, it's your birthday. Here's a gift. And they're like, I don't like you. Why would I want to take a gift from you? Then it's not theirs. They didn't trust me. If it, it's a free gift, but you have to want it. You have to not doubt God's love anymore. You have to turn from your sin and receive God himself. Stop dodging or denying. Stop dismissing or distorting. Stop hiding or blaming or running away. Things we off do all the time. But do you hear God's voice? Where are you? Where are you? And when you hear God's voice asking you, where are you? Just, just simply answer him. And it could be any number of answers. I'm in a really bad place right now, God. Thanks for asking. Or, I, I, just, I need your help. I, I need help. Or, or have, uh, to use a, a time-honored uh, prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Or, if God asks, where are you? Maybe you could answer, I miss you. Or, please forgive me again. There's no record in the scripture of anyone asking God forgiveness and being denied. So maybe it's for the first time. God is, is moving in your heart to ask, to answer him when he says, where are you? To say, Lord, here I am. I want to come back to you. I want to be forgiven. I want to believe in you. I want to trust you. I want to follow Jesus. Maybe that's the first time for you. Or maybe it's the thousandth time where you hear God's voice, where are you? Or maybe as the song goes that we got tired of, maybe it's the first time in forever that God is asking you, where are you? And that you hear his voice. Do you hear his voice saying, where are you? Because this is how we come alive spiritually. But we don't leave that behind. As many of us here have been walking with the Lord for many years, but we don't leave it behind. We don't leave behind the idea of repentance and forgiveness and following God. We just keep walking in it. We come alive spiritually by turning to God, but we, we grow spiritually by turning to God over and over again. So that's why we're here. You know, the, the one song that pretty much everybody knows, you know, I've done, a, I've done my share of funerals in town, and many of the f attendees at funerals have not been exposed to the hymns of the Christian faith. Let's put it that way. So not too many people know some of our songs, but everybody knows a song that goes like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I once was lost. That's Adam in the garden. He was lost. He chose to be lost, but he was still lost. That's me. When I'm running from God, I am lost. And I am found when he comes after me. Now, the, you may know, the writer of that hymn was a guy named John Newton, who was once a slave trader. I'm not sure I can think of a worse... Uh, behavior in the world is someone who was a slave runner. That person God rescued from that life of sin and death and made him lost, but then he was found. Toward the end of his life, John Newton said this, Although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. Now Adam and Eve, they doubted God's love. I'm convinced that was the root of their problems. They doubted God's love. But brothers and sisters and friends, can you keep doubting God's love? Because he died for you. He sent Jesus to die for you. Can you keep doubting God's love? Will you respond when he says, where are you? Will you respond in faith? Have you crossed over from spiritual death into spiritual life? If you have, then keep on 
walking with the Lord. Rejoice and follow him together and invite others along with them for the journey. Because we are surrounded by loved ones and strangers and everyone in between who are spiritually dead. And God is calling back to spiritual life. Maybe it would be one of us that God would use to share the good news. Because this we've been talking about, the, but this is not easy, to talk about the bad news. But we need to have a grasp of the bad news so we can enjoy the good news. Have you crossed from spiritual life to spiritual death? I hope so. And if, but if not, maybe today is the day of salvation for you. Where we say, yes, Lord, I believe. I trust you. I believe in you. I am turning from my sin. And I'm turning back to Jesus. I'm turning back to you and receiving Christ Jesus as my Lord because he died for me and he rose again from the grave. That is the gift that God gives us all. That is the gift that gives us spiritual life and spiritual nourishment as we move forward from this place. Now this is indeed the bad news, but the good news is that Jesus loves you. You are loved. You are loved by God himself. You are loved by Jesus Christ. You are loved by the Holy Spirit. Will you receive that and follow him even today? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you call out to us. You call out to us, where are you? And so we, in this moment, we ask for you to break through our defenses, break down our barriers, break down our doubts, our denials, our constantly distractions, our, our doubting you. And we ask, Lord, that you would show yourself, especially to those of us who may not yet trust you. And Lord, those of us who do trust you, that we might trust you all the more. And whatever areas in our life that we're still holding on to sin, that you would give us the courage to turn from that so we might grow even closer to you. I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters and friends. Would your Holy Spirit encourage us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the blessings of the Holy Spirit be on us all, now and forever. Amen.